We're so glad to have you all join us this evening, and we're so delighted to feature Dr. Punjabi in this wonderful program on Partners in Flight. I'm Susan Blancett, Vice President of Den Denver Field Ornithologists and uh, the Acting Chair of our Conservation Committee. I'm joined by Susie Hiskey of Denver Audubon and Peter Stoltz, our Zoom guru. This program is really exciting for us because it is the first ever collaboration of the conservation committees of both Denver Audubon and Denver Field Ornithologists. And we hope it will be the first of many such programs. So we hope you enjoy it this evening. I wanna thank Carl Brummert and the board of Denver Audubon, and of course our own Dave Hill, president of DFO and our board for supporting this collaboration this evening. Let's take care of some logistics. This program will be about 60 minutes long this evening. All of the attendees are muted. We want you to use the Q&A box to pose questions for Arvind and Susie and I will field those questions for Arvind to answer following his presentation. So use the Q&A box, not the chat box, if you please. And this program is being recorded for later viewing on both Denver Audubon's YouTube channel and DFO's website. So just a couple of words about Denver Field Ornithologists. DFO is the metro area's largest birding organization with about 500 members. We're known for great field trips and so much more, but um, all of our field trips and monthly programs are free and open to the public but we engage in a lot of citizen science workshops and other types of programs as well as grants and conservation activities. So, and of course, when we need to, we can rock the field gear and we like to have a lot of fun in the field. So one day we hope to see you out there with us. And we're so, again, we're so glad to have you with us tonight. Susie, take it away. So thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Susie Hiskey. I'm conservation coordinator for Denver Audubon. And our mission is inspiring actions for birds, wildlife and their habitats. We are a, an, an independent chapter of the National Audubon. So we are separate from National Audubon. We do work with them, but we raise all of our own funds, manage all of our own programs, um, and there are several other chapters in Colorado as well as Denver Audubon. And we have a variety of birding field trips as well. We also do workshops. We are in the schools with school programs and classes. We have a nature center at Chatfield State Park and several other types of programs as well. You can certainly learn more on our website, which we will share both of all of our websites later on this evening. And we couldn't do everything that we do without our very dedicated volunteers. So a huge shout out to volunteers who help us do all the programs and activities that we do. So I want to introduce Arvind Punjabi. Ar Arvind Punjabi is an avian conservation scientist at the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, where he has worked since 2000 to conserve nat native bird species through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. Arvind has focused much of his career on the conservation of birds in Western North America, especially in Mexico, where he has worked to develop the science, local capacity, and partnerships to advance strategic conservation in the country, which is great because as we all know, um, birds do move back and forth between here and there. Since his early days at Bird Conservancy, Arvind has also worked closely with the partners in flight to develop and expand the avian conservation assessment database, one of the most important tools for bird conservation in North America that you are about to hear about. Through his work compiling and curating data on the status and trends of each bird species on the continent, Arvind has become intimately familiar with conservation needs of North American birds. And when he is not in the field, the office or traveling, Arvind enjoys watching birds, playing his mandolin, and spending time with his wife Susan and two teenage boys. So please welcome Arvind Punjabi. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Susie. Uh, and thank you, Susan. Um, <clears throat> I'm so glad you both invited me to come here and share uh, a little bit about uh, the Avian Conservation Assessment Database. Uh, I was so 
excited when I first got this invitation because um, I've been the manager and steward of this database for over 20 years now, uh, since I've been at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And uh, this is the first time that uh, any local group here has asked me to talk about this database. Uh, but it really is an important database and it's increasingly getting a lot of attention and a lot of use uh, from a lot of different uh, organizations. Uh, and um, so I'm excited to share this with you and uh, share a little bit about Partners in Flight, as well as uh, some of the work we do at uh, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, Okay, let's see if I can get this technology working here. Great, so I'll just start off by talking a little bit about Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, many of you may already be familiar with us. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization based in Colorado, just outside of Denver in uh, Brighton at uh, the north end of Bar Lake State Park. And our mission uh, is and has always been the conservation of birds in their habitats through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. And we've always worked uh, across the full annual cycle of migratory birds uh, to deal with their needs wherever those might occur, from the Rockies to the Great Plains, Mexico, and beyond. Partners in Flight uh, is a network of more than 150 organizations throughout the Western Hemisphere that are engaged in all aspects of land bird conservation, from science to policy to education, uh, outreach, uh, land conservation, and land management. Partners in Flight was formed in 1990, and in fact is celebrating 30 years this year. Uh, just uh, shortly, uh, just formed two years after Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, or Colorado Bird Observatory, as we were called back then. Uh, and it was formed largely to address the declines in neotropical migrant land birds that became evident after the first publication on the analysis of North American breeding bird survey data that showed that uh, a large percentage of our neotropical migrants were declining. And this was published back in 1989. So Partners in Flight formed a year later uh, and had the mission then and still has it today of keeping common birds common and helping species at risk through voluntary partnerships. <clears throat> so one of the first challenges Partners in Flight faced was how to decide amongst the roughly 704 regularly breeding bird species in the US and Canada, which ones need attention most and first. This is complicated by the complex and diverse life histories of the myriad of bird species in our country uh, and their varying distributions, abundance, uh, their migratory travels and the threats they may face all along that range uh, and the different population trajectories of the different species. There were existing schemes out there such as the IUCN red list, uh, but these generally didn't address uh, species of more moderate uh, concern uh, and even some high concern species uh, in North America. And so right away, Partners in Flight realized that they needed an objective approach for evaluating and comparing vulnerability across species. So in order to determine which ones uh, should be prioritized for conservation, limited conservation dollars. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, they needed a database to store all this information in and to update it regularly. Now, I have a question for the audience. And uh, uh, so <clears throat> of those 704 re regularly breeding birds in the US and Canada, um, there is only one of those actually that is limited to breeding in Canada. I wonder if anyone here might hazard a guess and you could put your answer in the Q&A box as to which species of bird is the only bird in the US and Canada that, or it, within these two countries that is breeding only in Canada. Do we have any guesses? Try to keep you all awake and on your toes and hopefully share a little bit of bird knowledge with you all. 
So we're starting to see some guesses come in. I'm going to wait for a few more people to enter their answers before I start sharing them. Sure. So we have things like the Canada warbler, the extern, the snowy owl, Labrador goose, got another one for snowy owl, boreal chickadee, Smith's long spur, lots of guesses out there. Lots of guesses. Yeah, uh, all those birds uh, mentioned there breed also in the U.S., so there is one bird that does not. Labrador duck is another one that came up. I think I already said Arctic tern, maybe. Arctic tern, yeah. No, all those breed in the U.S. and Alaska as well, so, uh, but some good guesses there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let the bird out of the bag, so to speak. It's the common ringed plover. There is a small population of this bird breeding regularly in northern Canada, but that is the only place it does not get into Alaska or anywhere else into the United States. So that's the one bird species that Canada has that we don't have. Uh, on the other hand, um, out of those 704 species, uh, only about uh, well, somewhere just under 300 of those actually breed in Canada. So, uh, but. Uh, Canada and the U.S. have been working closely together in Partners in Flight since the early days uh, because of so many shared species. So uh, in developing this uh, approach um, uh, that essentially to evaluate uh, which birds need conservation attention most, uh, uh, Partners in Flight embarked on a long road of developing a standardized conservation assessment that would be able to treat each bird species on an equal footing to ensure that each one was considered fairly based on its biological vulnerability. And so as part of this process, uh, uh, we rank seven independent biological factors. And this is largely a data-driven process. There's really only one factor that is uh, based on uh, expert opinion. And this process has been peer reviewed. It was published uh, back in 2000 in the AUK by Mike Carter, uh, founder of Colorado Bird Observatory. Um, and, uh, and it was reviewed by the uh, AOU Conservation Committee at the time. And it was largely approved with a few recommendations uh, for how to make it better, which Partners in Flight has embraced uh, since then. And we have updated the process um, several times uh, over the years and uh, published documentation of that uh, on our website along with the database. So the species assessment process generates a conservation rank for every bird species uh, in mainland North America right now from Canada to Panama. That's about 1600 species and it identifies species both at high and moderate risk uh, of decline or extirpation or extinction. And it assesses each bird at two scales, a range-wide scale and also at a regional scale across all of North America. Simply put, the Avian Conservation Assessment Database is a repository for the information that's used and generated by the Partners in Flight Species Assessment Process. And it's a tool to help prioritize and coordinate bird conservation actions across organizations and across spatial scales and jurisdictional boundaries. And this is really important because um, if we were all uh, working on different priorities based on our own set of uh, priorities, <laughs> different species based on our own set of priorities, our actions would not add up across scale. So it's really important that we share a common set of uh, information and bird conservation priorities and address them where most appropriate to get the most bang for our buck. So the ACAD, as we uh, call it for short, uh, has, was developed and maintained and has been hosted by the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies since 1992 Although it was developed with contributions from hundreds of ornithologists, both in the development of the process and of the contents of the data within. It contains the latest available data on population size, trends, threats, distribution, and area importance for each of those 1600 species. 
And uh, for most birds in the database, it's updated every one to five years. We added the Mexican species to this database uh, through a several year long process, uh, which added about 504 species that previously weren't in the database. Uh, of course, we share many other species with Mexico as well. And then a few years later, we uh, embarked on a process to add the Central American avifauna to the database. Uh, and that added uh, another roughly 400 species or so that weren't found in Mexico or the United States and Canada. Now the avian conservation assessment database is used in many different applications. And these are just a few of the ones I'm gonna highlight here. Uh, but going back as far as uh, 2014, I believe, was the first State of the Birds report, um, <clears throat> or it might have been even earlier than that. Um, this is a report that is um, produced or be, was began being produced under a directive by the U.S. Secretary of the Interior, and it's a high-level document about the state of our birds that is intended for uh, members of Congress and uh, uh, officials within the Department of Interior. Of course, the ACAD, as we call it for short here, has also been the foundation for many partners in flight bird conservation plans, including both continental plans, uh, international plans, and regional bird conservation plans. It's also the source of the watch list, uh, something that has been uh, published not only by Partners in Flight, uh, but by other organizations such as American Bird Conservancy and Audubon. This is all the same watch list that uh, is generated by Partners in Flight as well. Uh, it is also the main source of information for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Birds of Conservation Concern List, known for short uh, as the BCC list. And uh, these were first produced in 2002, it was updated in 2008, and they are working on an update now. We'll see if it comes out in 2021. Uh, it was supposed to come out last year, so I expect it will come out this year. Uh, but that BCC list is incredibly important for uh, 20 US agencies that are mandated to pay attention to this list under an executive order uh, uh, 13186, which was signed by Bill Clinton shortly before leaving office in 2000, uh, about the responsibilities of U.S. agencies to protect migratory birds. Uh, so those agencies are required to pay attention to these priority species and to uh, avoid negative impacts to them. It's also a key uh, guiding document or guiding list for the Neotropical Migratory Bird Conservation Act program which prioritizes funding for species that are identified as conservation priorities in this database. Canada has used the uh, ACAT database as the foundation for their regional bird conservation strategies, uh, which they have 25 of across the country, uh, and uh, as well as for their own state of the birds reports. Finally, uh, <clears throat> The ACAD is used by uh, virtually all 50 states uh, for the, uh, to inform their state wildlife action plans, uh, including here in Colorado. Uh, so the priority species in there align in many ways with uh, the uh, ACAD database. The states also make add or consider other sources of information for their lists, but this is one of the foundations for that list. Uh, it's also the foundation for migratory bird uh, habitat joint ventures, uh, which if you're not familiar with, these are uh, partnerships, public-private partnerships led by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, that are intended to get partners together uh, to sum up their conservation work so that it can be more easily tracked, uh, more easily supported, uh, and uh, recognized. And there's many, many other users of the database as well, from academics, to uh, environmental consultants, to land trusts, uh, and other users. In fact, uh, one of the most uh, high profile uses of the database in recent years was the uh, development of our study that was published last year about the decline of the North American avifauna. Uh, 
uh, much of the information on the population sizes and population trends of birds that went into the study that showed that nearly 3 billion birds have been lost from North America came from this database. And this showed that there were several groups of birds in our region that are suffering greatly, uh, in particular grassland birds and even western forest birds uh, and other birds that may winter in our region, such as boreal forest birds like white crowned sparrows and many others, and many of the shorebirds that pass through our region are also steeply declining. So let's get into a little bit about what's in the ACAD. Well, there are six vulnerability factors, as we call them. These are biological attributes of each species uh, that can be relatively easily quantified. Uh, especially the population size, uh, distribution during the breeding season, uh, the extent of their distribution in winter, and uh, threats to both breeding and non-breeding uh, populations and areas, and the population trend. There are also, uh, and these are evaluated at uh, either global or continental scales uh, to develop, for example, the watch list. Now there are two other uh, factors that are also maintained and incorporated into the assessment. And these are area importance factors that uh, uh, identify the importance of one area for a species relative to another. And there's two ways to look at that. There's a relative measure of uh, importance, such as relative density, how abundant is a species in one region per acre or uh, compared to another region. And then there's another way to look at importance, and that's what's the total percent of a species population found within a region. So the ACAD maintains information on both these parameters for every bird species. And of course, these two factors, these last ones are evaluated only at a regional scale because they are regional numbers, regional figures. And as part of the regional assessment, several of the factors that are, ev that are evaluated at a continental scale uh, are also evaluated at a regional scale. So we'll get into a little more about how that works uh, more specifically in a bit. Uh, but each factor is scored on the same basic scale of one to five, where one always indicates low vulnerability and five always indicates high vulnerability. Uh, three also always indicates a moderate level of vulnerability or high uncertainty, which is also uh, uh, a cause for moderate concern. Now, there are a lot of data sources that uh, feed into the ACAD database, uh, but perhaps most important is the North American Breeding Bird Survey. Uh, because of its ex uh, vast extent and coverage uh, from Southern Canada throughout the, uh, the United States, uh, this has been the main source of information, and since it goes back to 1970, this has been the main source of information uh, for most species for trends and even population estimates and the relative density of one species in a region given, uh, compared to another. Uh, increasingly, we're starting to use eBird data, particularly for that relative density estimate. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that's being done, but uh, looking to the future, eBird is going to be increasingly important and relevant to this database. Uh, we've also used Christmas bird count data for a number of species that are not covered by other surveys, uh, or at least not well covered by other surveys. Uh, so that is an important source as well. Uh, we also use the International Shorebird Survey for trends on uh, most shorebird species, although there are some other shorebird uh, species specific surveys that we uh, rely on as well, such as for piping plover. Um, and then we use the US Fish and Wildlife Service waterfowl surveys, the BPOP surveys as they're known, uh, also the Arctic goose surveys to estimate trends on those birds. Uh, We've also used state and provincial breeding bird atlases, uh, primarily again to assess abundance uh, and relative density in different regions, as particularly some of the northern reaches of Canada that are not covered by the breeding bird survey. Those uh, breeding bird atlases have been, uh, and they include point counts, uh, they've been especially important for uh, filling in some of the gaps where we don't have other sources of information. Uh, we've also relied heavily on the water birds population estimates database, which is maintained by Wetlands International, uh, especially for some species that have uh, extend, uh, extensive ranges outside of North America, 
And likewise, we use the BirdLife International uh, database uh, to fill some important gaps for some uh, widespread species around the globe. We use the Birds in North America accounts and a whole host of other species specific surveys and reports on trends and uh, abundance population sizes of birds. Uh, all of our range information, uh, the breeding distribution factors are based on NatureServe digital range maps. So I think I've listed most of them there. I'll just run through a few of these uh, categories so you get a sense of uh, sort of this, the range and, and numbers and how they fall out. These are intended to sort of create a bell-shaped curve of, uh, of scores across the species. Uh, here with population size, you can see the population size criteria uh, go in an order of magnitude. So with the lowest score of one reflecting species that have populations with more than 50 million individuals. These are some of our most common birds. Uh, uh, all the way down to species with less than 50,000 individuals in their population. And these are again global populations uh, and that those birds receive the highest score of five for this particular factor. On the breeding distribution size, you can see again here how the, the scores vary in, in numbers from uh, the highest score of five, uh, representing less uh, species with a range less than 80,000 square kilometers during either the breeding or non-breeding season. Again, these factors are assessed separately for breeding and non-breeding. Uh, but 80,000 square kilometers, that's a pretty small area. It's about the size of North Carolina or South Carolina, excuse me. Uh, so you can see that on the map there. Uh, so species with a distribution around that size would be given a five. On the other hand, a species with a score of one or a, a range of over 4 million square kilometers, that's equivalent to about half the area of the lower 48 states in the United States. So that gives you a sense of the, the range of that parameter. And these are measured during the stationary period of each uh, season, the breeding and non-breeding. Of course, during the non-breeding season, birds may spend a lot more time getting to their non-breeding season and thus be spread out much, across a much larger area. But eventually, they get to a, an area where they're relatively stationary for a period of uh, at least a couple months. Uh, before beginning to fan out again. And so it's those smallest extents of distribution during the breeding and non-breeding season uh, that we are evaluating. Uh, the threats factors, uh, these are again evaluated separately for threats during the breeding season and threats during the non-breeding season. Now here, the non-breeding season threats can include threats during migration. Uh, <clears throat> And what this parameter evaluates is essentially the ability of current and future conditions to support uh, healthy populations, support population growth and survival. And unlike the, the population size and distribution factors, these ones are limited only to North America in scope. Uh, and these are scored both continentally and regionally. And we'll get into what those regions are in just a little bit. Uh, so again, this follows the same sort of balance of the scores where uh, one indicates a uh, high resilience or resistance to uh, any sort of change on the landscape. And in fact, conditions are beneficial or expected to improve for birds that are with a score of one. Whereas on the other end, uh, birds that are scored five, these are species where extreme deterioration in conditions is expected. And these species are in danger of extirpation from a region or ext extinction across their entire range. The population trend factor, uh, as you'd expect, this measures the direction and magnitude of recent population changes. So since 1970, and like the threats factor, this is evaluated only at the North American uh, scale for North American populations. So we don't go into South America for species that have you know, breeding population down there or into the old world uh, for species shared across the globe. Uh, and this again is scored at the continental level and again at each region. Uh, so here again, the, the, uh, the scores from one to five reflect a balance uh, from one indicating species that have shown a large significant increase greater than 50% uh, 
increase since 1970. Now this depends on high statistical precision with the survey data. Uh, if the data are less precise, and there's more uncertainty, even if it may show a 50% change, uh, if that change is not statistically significant, they will not receive uh, that score. So it gets moved more towards the middle, towards that uncertain category. You can see a score of three there can reflect a small decrease or an uncertain trend. On the opposite end of the spectrum there, the highest score of five, these are for, uh, for species that have declined by more than 50% since 1970. Uh, so that's a significant large decrease. Uh, now here I have another trivia question. We're looking at a trend graph on the right that is rather horrid. And we're looking at a trend map from the breeding bird survey that shows just how trends may vary across a species range. So we have uh, areas of red that are showing significant decline and areas of blue that are showing a significant increase. Anybody have a guess what species this might be? I know it's tough. And but if you think about it, this, this is a species that appears to be distributed across the boreal forest. Now note that area in gray at the top of the map, uh, it's not where the species range ends there. There's simply no breeding bird survey coverage above that area. So this is a species that's found across the boreal forest from the Northeast and then down through the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades. Uh, anybody have a guess as what this bird might be that is declining so precipitously, uh, both uh, across much of its range and in Colorado? So we're starting to get a few answers. I'm seeing a pygmy nuthatch. Go ahead and type your answers into the Q&A. Boreal owl is another possibility. Grasshopper sparrow. This is a forest bird. It's going, it's occurring in the boreal forest and through the coniferous forests of the west. We have another guess, a couple more guesses of evening grosbeak, oven bird. Hey, we'll, we'll stop right there because whoever said evening grosbeak was spot on. This is an evening grosbeak's population trajectory where you can see back in 1970, the average number of birds recorded on BBS routes was around 15, and today it's well below five, getting way down there, uh, close to about one or two. So that's a huge decline that this bird's seen throughout its range. We're fortunate to still have it in Colorado, but it is one of those species that's really in trouble. And it's one of those birds that's on the watch list. Great guess, great sleuth work, whoever figured that out. Um, all right, we'll move on here to uh, the next factor that's used in the assessment process. This one used just in the regional process. And here you see those regions up in the upper right. Uh, this is a map of North American bird conservation regions, something that was developed back around uh, 2000, 2001 uh, to help provide common planning units for all different bird conservation efforts. And these are biologically based units that uh, have similar bird communities within them uh, and therefore make, uh, make it easier to both analyze trends and data from these scales where you have similar bird communities and also a more uh, practical scale at which to implement um, conservation measures. So this relative density factor is the average density of a species within a given region relative to the region in which it occurs in its highest density. Uh, so again, this is using the bird conservation regions. Uh, and currently this is only scored for the breeding season. Uh, and that's because largely our data up till now has been limited to the breeding season because we've relied so much on the breeding bird survey. Uh, <clears throat> but we do have non-breeding assessments in the works now. So soon we'll be able to include all bird species within a region within the scope of our priority uh, lists for each region. Uh, so not just the breeding birds, but the ones that migrate through and the ones that come to winter. 
so again, this compares the, the density of a bird in one region to the density of a bird in the region which it achieves its highest density. And the scores uh, are scaled accordingly there. So um, <clears throat> there are, and now, as I mentioned, we've started using eBird data, which is not quite the same as BBS data. Of course, BBS data is a very standardized uh, procedure uh, where we get counts of birds and can uh, standardize that per uh, the specific effort, the number of counts that were conducted on a route. With eBird data, it's a little more complicated to uh, measure, uh, to standardize that effort. So we generally, generally rely on frequency data. And so this is the number of checklists or the frequency uh, in which a bird occurs on checklists, either present or not. Uh, so those scales are a little different and we have to uh, adjust our scales when looking at eBird data for, for species. But it's been incredibly useful for helping to fill some gaps uh, for species that are not well surveyed by uh, the breeding bird survey. Uh, but anyways, you can see the scale of scores on the left and you notice there's actually a score there called P. That is a, a peripheral score. It's meant um, sort of as a placeholder for species that are peripheral in a region may have only bred there regularly. Uh, they generally get included on the list because they have bred there, but they really have no conservation value uh, in that area because they are so peripheral. Uh, uh, but uh, starting at the other end of the scale with a five, we see that fives include any region in which the bird occurs in at least 50% of its maximum density. So take a bird like, um, Oh, let's say uh, grasshopper sparrow. And uh, I'm just gonna shoot from the hip here, but say it achieves its highest density in BCR 18, uh, but then also occurs in, you know, an average like 55% of its maximum density in BCR 19. Well, both those regions would get scored a five. Uh, so um, again, this helps us identify where uh, species have important populations and where it would make most sense to direct conservation efforts for a, for a species. Uh, let's see, so I'm gonna throw another trivia question at you here. We have another map down below. This is a, uh, an abundance map generated by the breeding bird survey. And this is the kind of information that goes into these relative density measures. So here we have a species that you can see has its highest density and abundance in the Southeastern United States. Yet, it also occurs across much of the West, uh, but in considerably lower density. So in this case, uh, and you can start putting your guesses into the chat, or not the chat, the Q&A, uh, if you have any guesses for what bird this might be. Uh, <clears throat> but in a case like this, clearly the species would be getting a five in uh, areas such as, uh, you know, the Mississippi Valley area and, um, uh, you know, in areas of Alabama, uh, Mississippi, uh, and East Texas. Any guesses out there? We have a couple of guesses for wood duck. Uh -huh, that's a good one. Not we it. Have the great egret is another one. Another one. Good guess. Yeah. That's all I have submitted yeah. so far. If you look at a few of the concentration points here for folks who've traveled down in the Southwest, this bird can be very abundant uh, in some of those areas uh, in the Big Bend region and in Southeast Arizona, uh, especially along rivers. And we have a guest for a Louisiana water thrush, a great blue heron. Good guess, I'll give you a hint, it is a land bird. So that eliminates most of the guesses, except for maybe the Louisiana water thrush. Yep. Any other land birds out there that you're thinking? This is a land bird that's incredibly abundant in the, in the southeast, but uh, I actually hear them singing from my yard here outside of Fort Collins, uh, up in the foothills, and they like to sing at night. Some good hints there. Who has another guess that matches those hints? 
I think you've stumped uh, them. This time. Stumped them. I know this isn't easy. Uh, you know, uh, this isn't easy to guess a bird by its range and abundance. But this is the kind of cool information we get from the database and by studying the database. Uh, so I'll let the bird out of the bag. It is the yellow breasted chat. Yes, indeed. Uh, if you ever go down to Louisiana and Mississippi in those areas, this bird is incredibly abundant and early successional habitats there. So, all right, moving on. Uh, so what do we do with all those scores for those different factors? Well, as I mentioned, there's two different levels of assessment. Uh, so for the continental assessment, we take the PS score and then we take the max, meaning the higher of either BD or ND. Those are the breeding distribution, non-breeding distribution scores. We take the higher of that, and then they take the higher of the two threat scores. Uh, and this is so that we're not overweighting those two factors uh, since they're not totally independent uh, from each other, uh, especially for resident birds. Uh, and then we combine that with a population trend score. And this generates a number that can range from four to 20. And uh, this is how the watch list is developed. And, and the watch list is simply all the species that uh, meet a, uh, that have a score of at least 14 or higher. And uh, there's a second list uh, that's been developed just recently uh, to sort of address some species that don't quite make the watch list, but are still showing some very steep declines that are troubling. And this is a group known as common birds in steep decline. So these are any additional species that have a population trend of five. Of course, they have to be native species um, to qualify for this. I, I didn't mention that earlier, but we do maintain some information in the database on uh, some well-established exotics, although they're excluded from these priority lists. Um, so uh, two, two lists developed from that continental level assessment, the, the watch list, and then the common birds in steep decline. And then from the regional assessment, which as I mentioned is only for breeding season right now, uh, we take those two global factors of population size and the global breeding distribution in this case, then combine that with the threats to breeding that have been assessed at the regional scale, along with the population trend that's been determined at a regional scale, like for one of those bird conservation regions, along with the relative density measured during the breeding season. And that generates a score that ranges from five to 25. Now, regional concern species, uh, the rule set is a little more complicated. It has to have at, at least a score of 13 or higher, but it also has to have a threats breeding score of at least four, meaning high threats, or a moderate threat score, a threats breeding score of three, with a population trend score of at least four. That means a significant uh, but a moderate decline or higher, it could be a five also. So those are the ones that are of regional concern. So they have to have a moderate combined score, but then also uh, it weights these uh, threats and population trend factors a little more heavily at the regional level. There is a second list that's generated at the regional level and that's the regional stewardship list. Now, this does not necessarily have anything to do with conservation concern, but rather identifies species in a region uh, that has a disproportionate pop, uh, percent of population in that region. And we've set that threshold at 25%. So if any species has 25% or more of its population in a single bird conservation region, and it has a threats breeding score of at least two, meaning it doesn't have a threat score of one, which would mean, indicate that is benefiting uh, from conditions there, but it's at least stable or not expected to change based on the conditions. Uh, those are recognized as stewardship species. So those are ones that we need to keep an eye on because uh, nobody else can really conserve those birds except for us. And we have a disproportionate responsibility there. Uh, all the species qualifying on these regional lists also have to have a relative density score of at least one. So it means they're not peripheral to the region uh, and they have to be native species. All right, so now let's get into some of the results. What does all this database tell us, at least currently? This is what it's telling us. Uh, the US Canada watch list, uh, which I just described how that's produced. There are 176 species out of the 704 
So that's roughly 25% of our avifauna that are on the US Canada watch list. This includes seven waterfowl species or roughly 15% of all waterfowl species, 23 shorebird species or 44% of all shorebird species, uh, 61 waterbird species, that's 39% of all of our waterbird species, and 85 landbird species, which is 19% um, of all of our landbirds. So the greatest number of species is landbirds, uh, but proportion to the number of landbird species out there, it's not as great when looking at uh, the shorebirds and waterbirds, uh, which proportionally have a much higher percent of their species in this category of uh, watch list, high concern. Now the watch list is broken out into uh, a couple different levels to help interpret it a little more easily. And so there's a red watch list uh, and uh, there's 39 species on that red watch list. These are species uh, that have multiple causes for concern. Uh, for example, they have small populations, small distributions, high threats and declining populations. This represents 22% of all the species on the watch list currently uh, in the US and Canada. And then there's the yellow watch list. Uh, there's about 78% of the watch list species. And there's two categories within this, species that are declining and have high threats and species that are range restricted and have small populations, but might not have high threats or declining uh, populations yet. And those are split roughly equally between those two groups, uh, at least in the US and Canada. Now there is a one other group that I mentioned, the common birds and steep declines. And uh, there are 42 species uh, in the US and Canada that qualify for that designation. So that's to say they don't meet the other criteria for the watch list. They probably have pretty large ranges and even some pretty large population sizes, but they have lost more than 50% of their population in the last 40 years or almost 50 years now, 50. Uh, and uh, some of the birds like that uh, on that list are common nighthawk, like you see over to the right. Now, when we compare this to the IUCN red list, uh, they only recognize 83 species in the US and Canada as either near threatened, vulnerable, or uh, endangered, or, uh, or above. Uh, so that's about half the number of species that the Partners in Flight system recognizes. Uh, and I think that's an important distinction. Now, looking at Mexico, we see a little different story. Mexico has uh, uh, 1,048 species breeding in, in Mexico, uh, or I'm sorry, not breeding, occurring in Mexico. Uh, and 402 of those are on the watch list. That's 38% compared to the 25% we have here. So pretty, significantly larger portion of species meet the watch list criteria. Uh, overall, there are fewer waterfowl species on that list, only about 8% of waterfowl. Uh, shorebird and waterbird numbers are not surprisingly uh, fairly similar to uh, in the United States. And again, if I didn't mention it, this does include migratory species on this list. So some of those same watch list species uh, that might breed in the Canada and Canada or the US and then come down to Mexico are included in these numbers here. Uh, <clears throat> but then note the number of landbird species, uh, whereas we had 85 in the US and Canada, Mexico has 324 landbirds that meet the watch list criteria. That's roughly 40% of all the landbirds in Mexico. When we break this out by the red watch list category, uh, we see that there uh, are 124 species in Mexico that meet that red watch list uh, multiple causes for concern, and that makes up about a third of all the watch list. And then the remaining birds are on the yellow watch list. Uh, and the, and uh, here we see the balance start to shift between those species that are on the list because of declining populations and high threats uh, versus a larger proportion now of range restricted and small population species. Uh, and that of course reflects the, the high endemism of species in Mexico. Uh, Mexico has uh, roughly 125 species that are either endemic or quasi-endemic to Mexico. 
uh, and they have only uh, 35 birds, common birds in steep declines. And this in part reflects that Mexico does not have trend data for most of these birds. So uh, there is a, a way to assess trends using qualitative criteria. And that's what was done in Mexico for many of these. Uh, but so there are fewer species that come out on the common birds and steep decline list, simply because we don't have trend data for many of the common birds in Mexico. Uh, now, when we compare this uh, assessment with the IUCN red list, uh, IUCN red list recognizes 109 species in Mexico, only about 10% of the avifauna. And so that's a quarter of the number of species that uh, the partners in flight system uh, identifies. Moving on to Central America, uh, Central America has uh, about 1,151 species, uh, according to our database, uh, that occur there. And fully 502 of those, nearly half, are on qualify for the watch list. Uh, we see, uh, again, a low number of waterfowl uh, on the watch list. And most of those more vulnerable, threatened waterfowl don't make it down that far. Um, and uh, the shorebirds, fairly similar elsewhere. These are, again, long distance migrants. So it's not surprising that uh, get the same shorebirds of concern in Central America as we do in Mexico and the US and Canada. And the waterbird numbers here again starts to drop. Fewer waterbirds make it that far south. Um, but look again what's happening to the landbird number. As we move south, the number of landbirds and the proportion of the landbirds uh, that are on the watch list increase as we move into Central America. And again, that's because we have many species with very small distributions, small population sizes, in addition to high threats. And, and declining populations. Uh, so 163 species out of those 502 are on the list for multiple causes of concern. And 339 are on there for either declining pops populations and high threats or um, range restricted and small population uh, uh, factors. And so again, that kind of reflects the, the breakout of those uh, two groups in Mexico as well, with a large number of uh, very range-restricted species. Uh, and again, a fairly low number of common birds and steep declines, largely due to the lack of uh, trend data for all species. All right, now when we compare this to the IUCN red list, we see an even lower percent that uh, that system has identified in Central America. Only 80 species uh, are recognized there as uh, either near threatened or higher on the IUCN red list. Uh, and that is uh, just a, a very small fraction of, uh, of what the partners in flight approach has identified. So just to review that a uh, little bit about the patterns of abundance and diversity in the north, we tend to have species that are much more widespread uh, with larger population sizes. Uh, but as we move south, uh, those distributions and population sizes tend to decrease, but the diversity of species increases. Uh, and if you look at the figure on the right here, uh, we can see that the first uh, couple groups, waterfowl and shorebirds are fairly similar. Uh, waterbirds also fairly similar, starting to decline uh, a bit in terms of their representation on the watch list uh, as we move south. Uh, but that number or proportion of land bird species that are on the watch list increases dramatically as we move from north to south. All right, I'm going to take us a little closer to home now uh, and focus in on our home state of Colorado and uh, the two main bird conservation regions in our state. And uh, these include the shortgrass prairie and the southern Rockies uh, Colorado plateau regions. And so we'll start with the shortgrass prairie, which has uh, 249 breeding species in it. Uh, 53 of those are recognized as species of conservation importance, uh, which includes both concern and stewardship species. Uh, 29 of those are regional concern species. And five of those are regional stewardship species, meaning they have a very high proportion of their population in the shortgrass prairie bird conservation region. Uh, four of those regional stewardship species are also recognized as regional concern. So these lists right here, the breakout of that 53 species, those are not necessarily mutually exclusive. 
Uh, you can have species recognized both for concern and stewardship, and they may even also be on the continental watch list. Uh, so out of those 53, actually 38 of those are also on the continental watch list. So we have a number of species in this region that are recognized at the continental level of being, uh, for being of conservation concern. When we look at the Southern Rockies, Colorado Plateau region, uh, this has a great greater number of breeding species, 294, it's about 20% uh, more. Uh, the number of species of conservation importance also increases up to 64 in this region. Um, and it includes 56 species of regional concern. That's nearly twice as many as in the short grass prairie, which may be surprising uh, given that there's so much concern over grassland birds. Well, that's true, uh, but there are many more species in the mountains than on the grasslands. So 56 species of regional concern and 18 species of regional stewardship. Uh, again, significantly higher than the shortgrass prairie, meaning there are more species that are restricted to this uh, region, the Colorado Plateau, uh, or at least not restricted, but have a high proportion uh, in this uh, bird conservation region. And 10 of those stewardship species are also recognized as regional concern species. Finally, the Southern Rockies Colorado Plateau also includes 44 watch list species or common birds in steep decline. So we have a number of uh, important and uh, vulnerable species in our region. Uh, and I'm sure many of you have seen those. And if you haven't, you should get out there and, and see them. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'll mention a few of these. I know there's a lot of names up here on the list, but here are a few of the watch list species that are in both these regions regions combined. Uh, and the ones that have an asterisk uh, after their name are also recognized as stewardship species. So no surprise there that Gunnison and sage grouse uh, is uh, on the red watch list for multiple reasons. And it's also a stewardship species. Similarly, the lesser prairie chicken is on there for multiple reasons. And it's also a stewardship species in bird conservation region 18, the shortgrass prairie. Uh, but there's other birds in our state, like the greater prairie chicken, black rail, piping plover, uh, the mountain plover, which is also a stewardship species, and the Ben Dyer's thrasher, which is pretty rare in our region, but does occur. Uh, these are all on that red watch list. Uh, looking at the yellow watch list, we have the declining uh, threatened group, which includes uh, perhaps some surprising uh, birds here, like cinnamon teal and Clark's and western grebe. Uh, but also birds like the black swift and even the broad-tailed hummingbird, which is both a watch list species uh, and a regional concern species and a stewardship species. Uh, Lewis's woodpecker in this group, olive-sided flycatcher, pinion jay, which is uh, experiencing one of the steepest declines of any bird on the continent right now. Uh, this is an important region for the pinion jay. Uh, if anyone can save the pinion jay, it's got to be folks in this region, uh, the Colorado Plateau, especially in uh, Southern Rockies. Evening grosbeaks in this group and the Virginia's warbler, a bird that is still relatively common along the front range, uh, but is declining uh, and is relatively threatened by ongoing development and climate change and other things. Uh, also not surprisingly in this group are a few grassland birds like McCowns and chestnut colored longspur. Uh, when we get to the restricted distribution, small population side of the watch list, uh, we're dealing with species that are mostly found on the western slope uh, or the western part of, uh, of the Colorado uh, Rockies uh, and uh, Colorado Plateau. Uh, birds like the California condor, which occur in, in northern Arizona and have a large population there that's been reintroduced but is now breeding on its own. Uh, so it's also a stewardship species in this region. Uh, same with flammulated owl. Uh, some of the other birds are more restricted to some different corners of our geography, like the Mexican whippoorwill, uh, the calliope hummingbird, uh, the black rosy finch, uh, but also on this list is the brown cap rosy finch, uh, which is squarely located in Colorado, um, as well as uh, birds like the red faced warbler, which make it uh, up into uh, northern uh, Arizona in the, in the Colorado Plateau region. So those are our watch list species uh, that we have in our area here. And these are again, recognized at a continental level for uh, concern. So not so much of what's going on at a local level, but we'll get to the local level stuff here soon. Now there are a few additional common birds in steep decline. Uh, 
uh, in our region, like northern bobwhite, uh, yellow-billed cuckoo, which uh, is also a species of concern in, in our region, uh, but continentally it's recognized as a common bird in steep decline. Common nighthawk, horned lark, even the western wood peewee is a common bird in steep decline. The cactus wren, pine siskin, eastern meadowlark, brewer's blackbird, and yes, the common grackle is a native bird species that is steeply declining across the country. Uh, and a Wilson's warbler, also a very widespread species, uh, one that uh, is quite abundant when we get up to the high country in Colorado, uh, but it's recognized continentally as a common bird in steep decline. Uh, getting down to the regional concern species, now these are the ones, uh, again, that had uh, uh, moderate levels of concern overall when looking across continental and regional scale factors, but then had uh, either high threats uh, and or high trend or steeply declining trends. Uh, so I'm not sure I'll list every bird here. There's quite a few names to rattle off, uh, but you can see uh, many familiar species. These are the list. These are the species that in our region are, are of concern because of things happening in our region, because of the trends of these species in our region and because of the threats these birds are facing in our region, combined with their overall vulnerability from the extent of their distribution and population size. Uh, again, a number of uh, stewardship species on here as well. So those are especially important to pay attention to if they're both of concern and stewardship importance. That means we have an extra responsibility to take care of those birds. So things like Williamson sapsucker, uh, Clark's nutcracker, uh, mountain bluebird, uh, lark bunting, and uh, Grace's warbler. Uh, these are all birds that have a disproportionate portion of their populations here in our regions. And we have a mix of both forest and mountain birds as well as grassland birds on this list. Uh, a few additional stewardship species that are not of concern uh, currently anyways, uh, still important to recognize uh, birds like Western Kingbird and Gray Vireo. These are not, uh, well, Western Kingbird is declining, but uh, uh, some of the other factors don't make it of concern yet. Gray Vireo, on the other hand, is, uh, you know, increasing uh, population trends over the last 50 years. Uh, so another, a number of these common birds uh, that uh, are disproportionately ours, so to speak. They're in our hands. Their future and fate is in our hands. Uh, so we need to keep a close eye on them. Now, um, I want to talk just briefly about uh, the importance of the ACAD for our own work at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Uh, for our science programs, our science is largely built, program is largely built around these priority species and we focus monitoring, attention, and research programs uh, specifically on the species that are identified as high concern uh, in the avian conservation assessment database. Uh, likewise, uh, the database and these priorities uh, form the themes and the focal topics uh, for many of our education programs, as well as the location of our staff and where we do education programs. Uh, we have a, a real strong interest in those programs, especially in the short grass prairie regions. Uh, and again, that's uh, in part due to the information coming from the avian conservation assessment database that tells us these are important areas to direct our uh, attention. Uh, and especially on the stewardship side of thing, also many of our private lands biologists that uh, are strategically located in areas of where there are species of high concern, such as in the grasslands and in the sagebrush systems uh, of our Intermountain West. Uh, and they also help to identify the priority species that those private lands biologists uh, focus on when they're out working with landowners uh, to uh, develop conservation plans and do habitat improvement work. Uh, so what is driving all this uh, you know, level of concern about our birds in, in, these, in our areas? Well, it's perhaps not surprising. I mean, in the short grass prairie, it's well known that conversion of grasslands to croplands is a major driver of bird population, grassland bird population decline. Uh, also, our increasing exurban footprint into the short grass prairie uh, and even into the agricultural lands is uh, again having a taking a toll on the habitat of grassland birds uh, in the shortgrass prairie region. 
Uh, and it's not just housing, uh, energy development is uh, both from uh, oil and gas, wind, solar uh, is also taking an increasing uh, chunk out of the landscape uh, and fragmenting many areas that otherwise were relatively pristine. Of course, climate change is a major driver, something that we're really just now starting to see the impacts of, uh, and uh, boy, is it troubling. I mean, just in Larimer County, where I live, uh, you know, no, we lost, I'm not sure, but I would hazard a guess of somewhere around 80% of our forests this summer uh, in the Cameron Peak fire. And uh, that's a rapid impact uh, that is largely due to climate change. So of course, there's also drought, <clears throat> which not only depresses food supplies for many birds, but can force other birds and other animals to change their behaviors and, uh, for example, start preying more on birds, whereas they may have preyed previously more on insects or small mammals. Uh, so things uh, like drought can create changes in the food webs that uh, you know, may have not been uh, very obvious or predictable before that. Uh, we also know that extreme weather in the grasslands can depress nest success, both if things are too hot and dry and if they're too cold and wet. Neither one is good for the reproductive success of birds in the system. In the Southern Rockies and Colorado Plateau region, we see some of these same threats, uh, but probably a, a greater uh, emphasis here on exurban development and uh, resort development, those kinds of things that are uh, eating away into the natural landscapes, uh, bringing with them all the things that they bring with humans when we move into relatively pristine areas. And on the other hand, climate change, something that is insidious and, and widespread uh, throughout our ecosystems. Uh, again, drought and like we saw this year, fire uh, and extreme weather like uh, we saw also this year with uh, the massive uh, bird deaths of uh, migrating birds in early September with a freak snowstorm and several day cold snap that killed probably millions of birds in our region. I mean, we could not even quantify it in time. Uh, but uh, these are clearly impacts from climate change. Um, <clears throat> and there are some threats that are uh, you know, uh, common across the regions. Uh, pesticides, um, pesticides is a big one and perhaps a driver of declines in many of our common birds, steep decline. Many of the birds in that group are belong to another group of birds called aerial insectivores. Those are the ones that get all their food essentially out of the air. Uh, <clears throat> so pet, the widespread use of pesticides, which has increased dramatically over the decades, uh, is perhaps responsible for that. We don't have, of course, studies linking directly, uh, many studies linking directly the effects of pesticides on birds, but those are starting to emerge. Uh, there was a study just this year on white crowned sparrows that shows that uh, you know, just a couple seeds of neonicotinoid treated seeds can cause these birds to get weak, sick, disoriented, lose weight uh, during their migration. Right when they're passing through these agricultural fields, when these pesticides are being applied, they are potentially taking up these seeds and uh, getting delayed on their migration, not making it to their breeding grounds in time, if ever. Uh, and the pesticides that are being used today uh, are literally a thousand times more toxic than DDT. So uh, there's great concern over pesticides and we really need to figure out a better approach for how to produce food uh, that is not so damaging to our environment. Uh, I already mentioned uh, energy development. I won't uh, hammer on that too much, but uh, obviously that takes uh, a chunk out of our landscape and it's not just oil and gas, it's wind and solar. Uh, free ranging cats, I'm sure all of us here are familiar with this issue. You know, it's estimated that they take somewhere between one to three billion birds a year out of the population. Uh, so a significant impact. Uh, similarly, collisions with windows, especially windows on homes, uh, has a, a very large impact on birds, uh, more so on homes than with other structures like wind turbines and buildings and cities. So um, uh, I, I talked about climate change, so I won't mention that again. Uh, but something else we need to consider too are threats to all these birds outside our region. Uh, you know, at least two thirds, if not three quarters, of all the species in our regions migrate uh, to elsewhere uh, during the non-breeding season. Many of those birds go down to Mexico, Central America, 
a few go on further down to South America, relatively few go elsewhere. Uh, but we need to be thinking about those as well and addressing threats in those regions if we want to conserve these species here in our home as well, because they are dependent uh, just as much uh, on habitats outside our region as they are on those within. <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to end with just something that we can all do about how to help birds. Uh, of course, keeping cats indoors, uh, uh, it's better for the cats, it's better for the birds. Uh, cats can live a, a totally happy life indoors. I have uh, two indoor house cats myself. Uh, and uh, I haven't actually gone and built a catio for them because they're just content looking at the birds through the window. Uh, but cats that spend their lives indoors live twice as long as cats outdoors. So that's another thing to consider. Uh, and it's, of course, while we may keep our own cats indoors, we should also be talking to our friends about keeping their cats indoors too and explain why. Finally, we need to, or not finally, uh, next, we need to make our windows safer for birds and there are proven solutions. Uh, I've recently done this to two of my windows on my house, uh, hanging these strings from the top. After a while, you just don't even notice them and I have not had a single bird collision with my window since I've done that. Uh, we also need to create a backyard bird habitat, each one of us. Uh, this can really help birds uh, during their migration or even during their breeding or non-breeding seasons. Uh, and avoid the use of pesticides in lawns and uh, in controlling weeds. You know, many weeds are actually very beneficial to birds, uh, both uh, from a food standpoint, especially also for nest material uh, and in other ways. So uh, weeds aren't necessarily bad. And uh, if you do control them, please try to avoid using pesticides because those uh, can have other effects. And many of the pesticides on the market today are neonicotinoid pesticides, which uh, increasingly are of concern, not only for birds, uh, but for bees and uh, many other uh, critters as well. We can all also drink bird-friendly coffee. Uh, this is something you can do to help birds outside of our region. Um, not only does the coffee taste great, uh, but you'll be supporting bird habitat and habitat for other animals. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time in coffee plantations in Central America and they can really be a haven, not only for birds, but for uh, mammals, monkeys, and uh, anteaters, and a, a whole number of other animals. Next, we should all reduce our use of plastics, avoid the use of plastics wherever possible, really think twice before ordering out, uh, take out food, uh, and talk to your favorite restaurateur about the, uh, you know, change, switching from plastics. If they're using plastics or styrofoam, uh, you know, say, I, I love your food, but I really wish you would uh, serve it in some cardboard instead. You know, there are alternatives out there and we simply have to wean ourselves as a society away from these plastics, which are now finding their way into our most remote ecosystems, including right up in Rocky Mountain National Park in our waterways there. Uh, lastly, something we can all do is go watch birds. Go find these important birds along the front range and in our state, and then share what you see through apps like eBird, your contributions uh, and entries in eBird will go eventually into the avian conservation assessment database and be used to inform bird conservation, uh, both in Colorado and uh, across the continent. And with that, uh, I'd like to close. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them if there's time. Thank you, Arvind. Um, so we're going to we're going to just pose a couple of quick questions at you because we're running a little over time. Um, so let me ask you from Colleen Nunn, if DFO were to adopt a, spe a species or a habitat, what is your suggestion for how to approach this decision? Hmm. Um, that's a good question, because uh, we do sit on the edge of these two bird conservation regions that have very different avifauna. So we could maybe consider adopting two species, one from each region, uh, or if we want to associate more with the, the plains where uh, DFO is probably more squarely located, uh, you could consider one of the many grassland birds that are of conservation concern, including our state bird, the lark bunting. Uh, but you could look at the database and, and, and select from there. You could go with either the most vulnerable or there's other reasons to um, 
to consider other species as well. You know, the ACAD assessment is really a biological vulnerability assessment, but there's other factors that are important too, like uh, how humans value individual species. So. Thank you. Thank you. Another Sophia, I think we just have time for one more. Yeah, we have a, this might be a quick answer. Um, is the database and the assessment data used by the Fish and Wildlife Service in listing birds as endangered or threatened? Um, it, it is used in that birds of conservation concern list, which is actually a list of birds below the threatened and endangered species list. So while they may use the information in the database, I think they consider uh, quite a bit of other information as well in making those listing determinations. But it does provide the foundation for the birds of conservation concern list. 